So this video is going to be a little bit different. Today I wanted to talk with you about how much change is actually possible for people. What's really achievable for most people in terms of improving mental health, dealing with their psychology, and generally living a, uh, a happy and fulfilling life? And this question gets to a huge issue with a lot of the content that exists in the personal growth space, which I think is based on a fundamental misunderstanding about what most people should really be aiming for. So there are five things I want to cover during this video. Hopefully, I'll be able to get to most of them. First, the reality of our constrained lives and how different people respond to this reality. Then second, how that response led to a certain kind of mental health content becoming dominant on YouTube and social media and podcasts, and also the lie that's implicit in that content. Then third, I want to talk about what's actually possible. What can almost anyone accomplish? Fourth, what are the tendencies of the brain that make doing this really difficult? And then fifth, two things. First, what almost anyone can do to improve their life. And then second, what some people might be able to do under the right circumstances. So let's start by talking about those constraints I mentioned at the beginning. For everyone who's watching this video right now, there is a range of outcomes that exist for you in life based on your unique circumstances. There are some doors that are open and some doors that are closed. And many of those circumstances come down to luck. Where and when you were born, the body you were born into, how rich your parents are, whether those parents, frankly, gave a shit about you when you were growing up, the seemingly small events that happened early on, the interactions with other kids that created a cascade that ended up with you landing in this decidedly imperfect and very human environment. You didn't choose any of that. You were dealt a hand of cards at the beginning of the game, and many of those cards relate to these big picture societal factors, everything from living under capitalism to sexism and racism that we have very little influence over. So the unpleasant and the obvious reality of life is that our circumstances are constrained, and those practical constraints that people experience have a huge impact on their mental health, a huge impact on how happy they are on a day-to-day -day basis, how fulfilled they can become over time, the other people that they end up interacting with that dictate a lot of what ends up happening inside of their relationships. Now, in the uh, psychology world, therapy, general personal growth, this question of what we can actually do while living under those constraints is enormous. It's kind of the whole game. And when people in the personal growthy world come face to face with the reality of our constrained outcomes, there's this spectrum of responses that people get sucked into that has two extremes. On the one hand, there are the social change absolutists. These are the people that say that because circumstances have such a huge impact on us, all that really matters is big picture societal change. There's a very little that we can do under constraint, so the self-help industry is basically this grift where we're trying to sell people a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow that just doesn't exist. And I gotta say, as somebody who makes content in this space, I am haunted by this argument. Um, I think that there is a lot of merit to it, in large part because I know that the single biggest mental health issue in the world is poverty. And it's number one by such a wide margin that I'm not even totally sure what number two is. I just know that poverty's number one. And at the same time, if you dig into the research on things like therapy or, or basic mental health interventions like a gratitude practice, what we find is that when people do them, they do tend to feel better, right? Then on the other side of the spectrum, there are the hardcore personal growth types. These are the people who give a vague hand wave in the direction of personal circumstance, a kind of the, the mental health equivalent of posting one of those black squares on Instagram back in 2020, while mostly focusing on everything else. They often have a miracle cure or this one simple trick where uh, it feels like they're saying that almost every problem in the world could be solved with enough kale or meditation. And if you just got past your limiting beliefs and like raise your vibration high enough, your dream life will appear to you and Prince Charming will ride in on his horse, money will rain from the sky and so on. Now, between those two extremes, there are plenty of frustrated yes and people who both appreciate that circumstances constrain what's possible for us and that our agency in changing those circumstances is sometimes very limited and that most people aren't going to get to live their ideal life in large part because of that. But because we don't have much control over that, it becomes even more important actually to develop some of the internal skills that allow us to relate to them 
more effectively. And almost everyone can do something inside of their minds to improve their lives. We, we influence what we can influence, we accept our limitations, and we try to come to peace with things along the way. Okay, so we've got these two extremes and that spectrum in the middle. The problem is that self-help content in general wildly over-represents that second bucket of people, the one simple trick people. Most of the books that you read or the videos that you watch on YouTube or the podcasts that you listen to or whatever else are going to be produced by one of them. And the reason for that is that that worldview is incredibly successful. So it tends to rise to the top of search results. It's really tempting to think that that is how the world works. We want to believe that if we just knew this or did that, our lives would be totally transformed. And frankly, it's not compelling marketing copy to say something like, life's hard, circumstances are constrained, a lot of days are going to be tough regardless of what you do, but if you really work on it, you might be able to improve some things. It's a lot more compelling to say, this program will just teach you the secret to happiness. And the obvious problem with this brand of self-help content, and I'm not the first person to say this, and this isn't just the extremists, but really anyone who overclaims how much agency we have to solve our problems just by doing stuff inside of our minds, is that it turns all problems into problems of effort. And effort, whether somebody is willing to work harder, often has this moral and extremely judgmental component to it. So what does this look like in practice, right? Maybe in the more moderate range, this might be some self-helpy person saying something like, hey, you still have these symptoms related to your complex PTSD or your uh, OCD or your ADHD or whatever else because you just haven't done the work yet. And if you just did the work, you would solve all of these problems that you have. And then in the extreme, it could essentially look like somebody saying, you're poor because you haven't raised your vibration high enough yet. And something I've been reflecting on a lot recently is that there's this kind of interesting parallel from developmental psychology. Like when kids are raised in chaotic and abusive environments, they basically have two choices. They can either believe that they're the problem or they can believe that their caregivers are the problem. Now, looking at it from the outside, any reasonable adult would say, hello, the caregivers are the problem here. And this is so poignant to talk about. It's actually like pretty emotional where kids are so desperate to feel like they have a sense of influence over their environments that they make themselves the problem because they can control their own behavior. They can't control the system around them. And what you see in people recovering from developmental trauma is that they often blame themselves rather than the system, even as adults. And this is because, again, if they're the problem, there's something they can do about it. It's a way for them to reclaim that feeling of agency, even if the agency is an illusion. And it's really interesting to think about that extreme self-help content through that lens, where people are so desperate to feel like they they can actually have a sense of control over their circumstances that they will quite literally turn to magical thinking. And it's not hard to find people on YouTube or podcast content or whatever else, people who really do sound that way, where all problems are solvable through a little effort and my $200 manifesting course, where a state of perfect fulfillment is available to all people if they just tried hard enough. But the truth is that what's possible for somebody who was dealt a great hand of cards might not be possible for somebody else. And in most personal growth content, it feels like the target we're aiming for is this theoretical state of perfect functionality where you just have it all dialed in and you're living this ideal and fulfilled life. And this is the vision that we typically get sold on social media. It's the mask worn by a lot of people in the space. And I think that the dominance of that target as the aspiration really did a lot of people dirty because it creates this situation where most people feel like they're falling short most of the time, and it makes it a personal failing when they do. It's you. You're the problem. So what's the alternative to this? What can most people really realistically accomplish under constraint? And there's this concept from psychology that I love, and it's the idea of becoming a normal neurotic. This is somebody who experiences typical human problems. They're anxious. They don't always do what they should do. They get into conflict with other people. Uh, they have weird thoughts that pop into their mind from time to time. They've got their own neurotic tendencies and internal bullshit. And even so, 
they're able to deal with these tendencies and be reasonably functional, even really very happy, regardless. They're not sitting on top of a mountain somewhere with perfect mental clarity. They're making it work during a normal life. And look, again, I get it. Aiming for normal neuroticism is uh, probably not a target where if you put it into the sales copy, it's going to sell a lot of books, right? And that's why you see the content that you do, because it gets clicks. And to be perfectly frank, sometimes we talk about the things that we talk about on Being Well, which is the podcast that I host, because I know that those topics are going to generate traffic. But in a world where we're constrained by so many things, it is really powerful to have something that we know we really can do. This is an achievable target most people can reach. Is it going to sell the books? I don't know, but it's real. And engaging with this process of becoming a normal neurotic can actually get people way further than they expect. So that's our new target for people who are in the 40th percentile of the circumstance distribution. Our circumstances are constrained. What can we do even so? And what are some of the key and fundamental skills that help people get there? How can we get to happiness even under constraint? Now, there are a million things that I think most people really can develop over time. All kinds of inner strengths and skills. You know, we can become more patient or courageous or compassionate and so on. But there are two that really stand out to me as things that almost anyone can learn how to do and which are the basis of most other things. We can learn how to enjoy our good experiences more first. And then second, we can learn how to deal with our bad experiences more effectively. Most stuff comes down to that. We're all going to have both difficult and enjoyable experiences, and we want to do what we can to create more of those good moments. But remember, many of those moments are dictated by circumstance. Sometimes the present moment just sucks. But whether it's good or bad, what we have the most influence over is how we relate to it. Bottom line, are we adding suffering or are we removing suffering? And we can think about this kind of technically, if this sort of thinking appeals to you. If it doesn't, you can just skip this section. We can think about our experiences as having an emotional range from like minus 10 to positive 10. Eating an ice cream cone is a plus four. Getting yelled at by your boss is like a minus seven. So sometimes we can do more things to get more enjoyable experiences, but we're often limited in that. We're not doing something magical to transform a bad experience into a positive one. We're doing something small to turn a plus three into a plus four. For. And that is often all that is available to us. We're not ascending to some point where we're no longer bothered by being yelled at. But what you notice if you go down the path of small wins is that your days get a lot smoother. And these small changes have this huge compounding impact over time. Some days are always going to be tough and we'll probably never achieve, you know, perfect mental health, whatever that means. But we will start to unravel our own shit and our lives will become more enjoyable and fulfilling if we're able to do this over time. Okay, so what gets in the way of this? And one of the central problems here is that the machinery we're working with, our brains, have got some serious issues. The brain has a couple of tendencies that make it really hard for us to maximize the enjoyability of our good experiences and minimize the suffering of our bad experiences. It also has a number of tendencies that make it more likely that we'll have more shitty experiences altogether. The first big tendency is the brain's negativity bias. This is one of the most well-researched features of the brain. Basically, the brain pays a lot more attention to negative stimuli than positive stimuli. This is probably for evolutionary reasons. To really oversimplify this, you can imagine that you're one of our small rodent ancient ancestors. If you don't find delicious food today as that little mouse, you might be able to find delicious food tomorrow. But if you get eaten today, you're never finding delicious food again. So the brain has a natural tendency to be threat averse. And it generally pays a lot more attention to the negative stuff than the positive stuff. And you can see this in your own experience. Particularly if you just look back over your past week. What stands out to you? For most people, it's going to be the coworker that said something dumb. It's going to be the person that cut them off in traffic. It's going to be the interaction with a friend that went a little sideways for whatever reason. It's not going to be the many, many little positive moments that we all have, even in the course of a difficult life. It's not the tasty drink that you had in the morning or the person who smiled at you or uh, the person who let you merge, whatever it is, right? All of these little positive experiences 
these kind of blend into the background for us. They become sort of like wallpaper. We just stop noticing them after a while. Now, the second tendency that the brain has that makes all of this really difficult to do is actually a little harder to talk about and explain. But for purposes of this video, I'm going to call it the brain's craving drive. And uh, we can think of craving as just wanting things, and particularly this kind of wanting that has a insistent or even pushy feeling inside of us that it's hard to find the right language for, but you know it when you feel it. And we can tie this into some plausible evolutionary psychology here. So think back to that little mouse, right? And that mouse is eating a carrot. It makes sense for the brain to focus on how enjoyable the experience of eating the carrot is, particularly the first time that it eats the carrot. That carrot is literally the most delicious carrot that mouse has uh, ever consumed, much like I am literally my mother's favorite son. Um, so, you know, it, the brain wants to teach us to go and get more carrots, right? The brain wants to reinforce what's known as the reward value of that experience. So you're going to be motivated to pursue more carrots in the future. More carrots means more energy, which means you get to live longer, which means you pass on gene copies. And when thinking about this, it's helpful to remember that that's all the brain cares about here. The brain doesn't care about your fulfillment. It just cares about promoting certain behaviors that make it a little more likely that you'll pass on your genes. So, okay, mouse with the carrot. After the first, or maybe the second, or certainly the third time that you've eaten that delicious carrot, its reward value has gotten pretty fixed in the brain. It knows the experience, it expects what it gets, it has the carrot, it's like, yes, delicious carrot. The brain doesn't need to focus on enjoying the carrot anymore but it does need to focus on getting you to find more carrots. And this leads to this bizarre experience that infects how we move through the world. The tendency that we have to want more things even while we're getting the thing that we want. So let's go back to that dish of ice cream. You're having that uh, wonderful plus three or plus four experience, but as you're having it, you're also thinking about these other things, you know? You're thinking about what you're going to be doing next Friday night, or, hey, maybe there's something else that's uh, delicious in the pantry that you could think about eating in the future, or, you know, wow, that person said that really weird thing to you that one time, and now you're, you're kind of preoccupied about it. You don't really know why they said that to you, and then you look down, and the bowl of ice cream is gone. And that's the craving drive of the brain in real time because the brain doesn't care about enjoying the experience after the reward value has been fixed, but it does really care about motivating you to consume more experiences. Uh, to talk about this more technically, the brain is shifting away from liking the experience that you're having into wanting more experiences. And that right there is how you turn enjoyment into unpleasantness. That's how you turn a plus two into a minus two. That's the whole game. And we can see it over and over again in our lives. Even during a tough life, most people have a bunch of everyday normal good experiences. And so the question is, what are we doing to allow those experiences to become the basis of positive learning or, or help insulate ourselves against negative experiences? But basically what we're doing is we're doom scrolling our way through life where we're fixating on the bad stuff and zipping past the good stuff. And uh, to use one example for this, I dance seriously as a hobby, and I have a lot of other friends who are professional dancers. And for many of them, if they do well in a contest, they're immediately thinking about the next contest and whether or not they'll do well in that one. The trophy is just kind of tossed into the bin. But if they do poorly, it's this huge source of suffering. So we're essentially only allowing ourselves to fully experience our negative experiences. And if you stack that on top, of a great life, a great hand of cards, even the easy things start to become really hard. And if you stack it on top of a normal and constrained and difficult life, wow, that is a recipe for permanent unhappiness. So we've got these two impediments. We've got the negativity pious on the one hand, and we've got our drive to crave on the other. Now, what can most people learn how to do? And it's three things. First, emphasizing liking being present with the normal good experiences of life. Then second, slowing down wanting, staying in the moment without shifting and craving. And this is the stuff that helps us stick with a plus two and maybe even bump a plus two into a plus three 
from time to time. And by the way, uh, as a little detour, you might be listening to this and asking yourself something like, well, aren't just wanting and liking the same thing? What are you talking about here? And no, they're not actually. There's this really interesting fMRI research on the brain that shows that wanting and liking are tied to these different systems inside of the brain. They have some overlap, but they are neurologically different experiences. And this explains why it's possible for somebody to want something, uh, like an addict that wants their next hit, or that person who sits at the slot machine and just pulls the lever over and over again without actually enjoying the experience that they're having very much. And so critically, that means that it's possible for us to like things without really wanting more of them. And we can hang out in pure enjoyment without slipping into craving. So then, okay, we've got those two things, hanging out and liking, being thoughtful about wanting. What's the third thing that we can do? We can develop coping skills. Stuff happens to everybody. How can we relate to that stuff in healthier and more productive ways? That's it. That's what I prescribe to most people. And I think that if most people put real dedicated effort into it, they'd improve in each of those areas. Now, if that sounds a little uninspired and unimpressive, what I'd say is that as you're going through this process, what can feel like a pretty simple process of hanging out and liking more and getting better at noticing when your brain starts craving things and developing some basic coping skills, all of this cool stuff starts to happen. You start to get a little less bothered by the dumb things other people say. You start to let some bad pitches sail on by you that you would have unnecessarily taken a swing at in the past. Uh, As you get better at being with your experiences, enjoying them for what they are without craving some slightly better version of them, some very cool states of mind become available to us. And life just gets a lot smoother. As we start shifting the overall climate of our internal emotional environment, just a point or two up the scale that can really snowball over time. And that's the first track. Hanging out and liking, relaxing around wanting, getting better at coping. That's available to almost anyone. And then alongside that, there is this very cool and very deep process that's a bit harder to talk about. It's a second track that runs parallel to the first track. And it's the track of getting more awareness of and insight into our interior. And this is a huge category, but it's what allows us to better understand ourselves. This is where we start unpacking our personal history and gaining more awareness of our patterns of habit that make up most of our behavior. And as we untangle those patterns, we start to really learn more about what we really like, what our true desires are, and what really matters to us in life. And this then means that we get better at resisting what's sometimes called the allure of middling priorities. That's all the stuff that's appealing enough to distract you, but not appealing enough to fulfill you. And this process is what often leads to those breakthrough moments where, for example, we finally choose a partner that's actually healthy for us rather than chasing the same old kind of person who has never worked out in the past and will never work out in the future. It is a subtle and more internal and not as skills-driven process as the first track. It's also got a lot more ooh to it for people because it's more about the mysteries of our deep psychology. But here's the thing. There are two big problems with the second track. First, in my opinion, it's just not available to everyone. And then second, because it's kind of more sexy and appealing, people can get really trapped in it. It is so easy to get stuck in these cycles of navel gazing where we are just like constantly riding the train of developing more insight without ever crossing into action. And what's nice about the first track is that it's all action. In the first track, we are constantly returning to essential questions. What are we doing right now? What are we doing even so? What do I have influence over? And what can I let go of? It is hyper-practical, and there's this inherent feeling of movement and progression. And all of this is only made worse by the fact that most of the self-help content out there focuses on the second track because, again, it tends to create better marketing copy. So then, backtracking to the first point, I know that the first track is available to the overwhelming majority of people, but I'm not sure that the second track is available to everyone for very understandable and practical reasons that have to do with our constrained circumstances. Maybe you just don't have a life that allows you to engage with this process. 
Maybe you're buried under other obligations and a difficult past and resource limitations. Maybe you need a therapist to do this kind of work. And therapy is expensive, insurance is a nightmare, our healthcare system is profoundly broken. Maybe you've got some significant underlying health issue or a neurological condition or whatever else that makes that kind of work really unrealistic. Or maybe you just don't have the time or the space or the interest, and that's okay. You're pretty content and accepting of the way that you are, and you're mostly interested in picking up some practical skills. And my whole point here is that's all right. I know everyone listening to this can get a ton of value out of the stuff I was talking about earlier, about our relationship with like wanting and craving and liking and enjoyment. And there is an opportunity that we all have every day to develop those practical skills and get more out of life. It is possible to do the first track without touching the second track. You don't have to do some kind of deep inquiry into the nature of who you are. But what happens a lot in the personal growth space, in this kind of self-help content world, is that we set an unachievable standard for people based on that second track. And this poor person that I get emails from all the time who says something like, I just see these other people who seem like they're doing so much better from, than me, and nothing I do works, and there, there must be something that is deeply wrong with me. And there's nothing that's wrong with you. The standard that has been set is just an unrealistic one. You are a good-hearted, normal person who's probably doing better and getting further than the overwhelming majority of people out there. What's happening is that you've been sold a false bill of goods by people whose personal profit is tied to making you think that they have all the answers. They are selling you an illusion that often isn't possible under real constraint. But I know I can help just about everyone do three things. Get better at liking, relax around wanting, develop coping skills. And I get that that's not going to sound appealing to everyone, and maybe I'm aiming a little too close to the ground here. I might not be doing a great job of uh, pitching my podcast to you or selling my future book or whatever. But I actually don't think that this is like a small goal. I actually think that this is a huge and crazy dream. This stuff is so aspirational to me because anyone can do it. And that is incredible. Like, let's go back to where we, where we started, right? Constrained circumstances, tough lives, living in a for-profit world, uh, a pandemic, whatever else is going on in your life in this moment. And even so, you have the ability to exercise some agency inside of your mind. It might be limited, and this might sound really obvious to people, but it's one of those things where there is a huge difference between how something sounds and how it impacts us when we really feel it and live it moment to moment in our lives. So this was a pretty different video. Uh, for starters, it was much longer than normal. And I don't normally record this kind of thing, but I would love to hear some comments from you about what you thought about it. What's your experience with these ideas been and with content in the self-help space more broadly? And I'm just really curious how this lands for people. Uh, maybe there are some people who it will interpret it as being like a little depressing and kind of limiting. And I also hope that there are some people out there who feel actually really freed by it. So until next time, thanks for watching.